spoke to you about grits and rocks. Um, I talked to you about how we, God has, has, has brought us uh, to be like grits, that there's no such thing as a grit. There is no such thing. There are grits. And we need to be grits, to be meshed together. And sometimes to be seasoned with a little salt, a little butter. You know? when, 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 when the, if there's a grit, that means it's gotten outside the pot and it's become hard, right? And we don't want to become hard. And I also caution you, you know, if you're not careful as you move away and become hard that you might all of a sudden get stirred in with some cream of wheat or some oatmeal. You don't want that either. So we, we are called to be together. We're called to meet together, to come together. Then in, in, uh, in June, I spoke of you of standing firm, uh, of standing firm through the season we're in, standing firm in your faith, standing firm in your belief, standing firm in your resolve, standing firm in your life out in the, in the natural. I spoke to you about standing firm. Then earlier this month, uh, I spoke to you on uh, July 2nd, I believe. I spoke to you about small people and small things. That even though we are smaller, and maybe we don't have people with lots of influence, we do have people with talent, but maybe we're not overloaded with those people. I don't know. But I spoke to you about how God uses them anyway. I, I spoke to you uh, about such people as Tychius and uh, 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 Aristarchus or uh, uh, something like that, that you don't remember their names and, 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 and Paul greets them at the end of, of a letter. But, and, and I told you of their roles in the early church and although, although they weren't well known, they played vital roles. They were, they were small in the scheme of things. They were not part of the, 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 the apostleship uh, and they weren't that well known, but they were important to the work that was being done on the earth. I, small, I spoke to you about we are important. God has given us a huge mission to play a role in. And maybe our role is a small role. I don't know. Or it may be the leading, most important role. I like to think that. Um. So I've, I've tried to, to bring those things that, that God has, has, has given me uh, that maybe you might be encouraged, uh, you might be admonished to help prepare you, to teach you, um, to equip you for the season we're in, for, for, the, for the goal that's ahead of us, for the mission that's ahead of us. And, and today I, I want to try to continue in that, in that vein uh, and bring you a little something else, another, maybe, maybe a, a, a teaching, a preaching, a, 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 an exhortation. I'm sorry, Josh. Um, he says it's particularly hard when I go up the aisle, but I do that sometimes to wake people up. Um, now, I will tell you this. I'll probably get in trouble with some of you when you go home and research your Bible for today's subject matter, and uh, you may think, well, I don't see the distinction Otis has made this morning explained in the Bible, and even maybe this may be a teaching moment for Russ. He may see it as a teaching moment to straighten me out and uh, get my, my theology back in line. I don't know, but I do feel uh, that um, what I'm going to give you was revealed to me. Uh, I do feel that it's, uh, it is uh, that, that you might be exalted, that you might be encouraged, that you might seek another level in your walk with the Lord. So, there's a story of a, of a man that uh, on a Friday about midday, he, he went to a church and he went into the sanctuary and he began to pray. And he was saying, God, Lord, allow me to win the lottery. Full of faith, allow me, Lord, to win the lottery. And he, he, he left the church and two lottery drawings passed and nothing had happened. He, he went back to the church and he prayed even harder, more fervently, really impassioned, 
really seeking God, said, God, help me to win the lottery. And two more lottery drawings went by and nothing happened. He returned to the church and he looked up kind of angrily and he said, why don't you give me a break? And suddenly this powerful wind swept through the, the sanctuary and this deep voice says, give you a break? Why don't you give me a break? At least buy a ticket. <laughs> so what, what I'm, I'm, I'm not promoting the lottery, by the way. I don't, I don't play the lottery. I'm not promoting it at all. Uh, I just ran across that and I liked it. Um, the, the man had faith. He, he went in with faith, but uh, there was something missing. And I want to talk about what was missing in, in that this morning. Remember when your children were, were small? And at that time, they still, they, you remember back in the time, they still had faith in you? <laughs> Doesn't last forever, believe me. But then they, they got big enough that you could put them in the tub to wash their hair. You remember that? And, and so when it was time to wash their hair, you would tell them to, you know, you would, you would, you would, uh, you would, you would rinse, you know, rinse your hair and then, you know, with a lot of uh, cajoling and, and uh, encouragement and uh, maybe a threat or two. And, and so you would get the hair wet and then you would begin with the lather. Now you're having to do probably at this point some more cajoling and some more encouragement and firm encouragement, you know. And then comes the dreaded rinsing. So you ask, you, you demand, you help, for them to close their eyes and tilt their head back. And then knowing what you're doing, you take your hand and you put it on their forehead between the hairline and their eyes and you begin to rinse. But inevitably, inevitably, they will open their eyes and force their head down. And soap will enter their eyes, and then comes the yelling and screaming and crying from Hades. Some of it's real, there's some pain. Some of it's, I, I told you so. Some of it's, I knew you couldn't do it, you know. But they had faith in you. So what was missing? So I'm going to read you from the New, New King James Version, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and he will direct. It, you know, I've said this several times here. And, and I've seen this, I even went through this myself, you, you feel very strongly that God is calling you to, to something, you know? And like me, it was to go to Kenya. At first it was to come here. But he's calling you to something, and you think to yourself, oh, I don't have enough faith to do that. Leave my job, do this, do that, whatever. I don't have enough faith. And, and you say, Lord, I'll do it, but I need a little more faith. So what I explained to you is, well, wait a minute. You might not have a, a, a faith problem. It might be an obedience problem. And that if you'll take that step and head toward where he's calling you, when you get there, all the faith you need will be there. See, mistake one that said you, you needed a little more faith, which implies that you already had some faith. And, and, and in Matthew, it tells us that faith as a mustard seed will move mountains, right? But you're saying, I need a little more. Well, that means you have some. And you probably have enough to move a mountain. It's just obedience. Your mistake number two is you, you didn't have a faith problem. You had an obedience problem. That was mistake number two. But I was saying you step from here to there, and I think 
most of the time, you'll find the faith that you needed. So if you had the faith needed, what is that actual, actual physical movement forward, movement into what he's calling you to do, what is that called? And I think it's called trust. So what is trust for a, 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 a Christian? Isn't trust the outward expression of, of a Christian's uh, faith in Christ? It's an outward expression of that, a, a physical, physical expression uh, for the faith that you claim to have. It, uh, when, you exhibit, when, you, when you exhibit trust, aren't we physically demonstrating uh, the intangible element of faith? Isn't that what trust is? So I like to think of it this way. These are my words now. Okay, but God gave them to me. That for me, true trust is faith put to the test. And, and, and how do you know for real, for sure, that you trust God until you put it to the, your faith to the test? How do you know, how can you say, I trust God with the, every fiber of my being? How can you say that? It's, it's like I've often wondered, if I went to war, would I stand and fight or would I run? Well, I think I would stand and fight. But how do I know if I've never done been there? You know, How do I truly know how I would react? How do you know that you truly have abiding trust unless you step out and actually put your faith to work, to the test? There was something this morning talk in prayer about putting faith to work. The, the Hebrew word that's used for trust in, in Proverbs 3 here, uh, 3, 5, is bata. I tried to even get that little bata. In the King James, that word is used 120 times in the Old Testament. And 103 of those times, it is used, it is translated as trust. Now, in no instance is it translated like some other words are. In none of the instances that it's not translated as trust, it also is not translated as believe, belief, or faith. But out of 120 times, 103 times, it's translated as trust. So trust in the Lord. It's trust standing alone, isn't it? That's the word. There are other words that could have been used there. But he used this word. John 14, 1 says this. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Now, that's the NIV. Several other translations, some very popular translations, don't use the word trust there. They use believe. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. But the NIV says trust. Listen to what the, the Message Bible, the Message Bible says it this way. Don't let this throw you. You trust God, don't you? Trust me. So, when I was looking at these words in the Greek, I, I basically looked at four words, two for each, because as I researched, two words came up uh, 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 for, uh, for, for each. And uh, in, in, in none of those, in, in, all, in all but one uh, case, I found that the King James had all four words used, uh, had been translated at least once, either as believe or belief. So here, there, there is a, the, you know, there, are, there can be a, a crossover. But I have been led to believe that, that, uh, that, uh, that belief, faith, and trust are three separate elements. Now see, this is where I'm going to get in trouble with you. Three separate elements that stand alone. However, they are so linked that it's impossible to see one operating without the other. For, for me, uh, for me, it, 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 it's it's just as uh, there's a logical uh, order of the occurrence of the the three elements of salvation. There's also a logical order of progression from belief to faith to trust. See, I don't think you're going to find this written out in your Bible, but I'm going to show you in a little while. It is demonstrated. 
It is demonstrated in the word. So the three elements of salvation, justification, regeneration, and sanctification. Now, do they follow one another or are they simultaneous? Well, I think they all occur at the time that you receive Christ. However, I think there's a logical order. In, in, in other words, first the sinner is set right in relation to God's law. That's justification. That's needed. The sinner's life is out of order and must be changed. That's regeneration. The sinner has been living in sin, living for the world, and he must be separated, which is what, what uh, sanctification is, must be separated to a new life and a new works, a new service. So there are there are three items, and they are simultaneous in that they cannot be truly separated. The outward change, justification, is followed by the inward change, regeneration, which is followed by dedication to God's service, which is sanctification. So it's hard to believe that a, a truly justified person could possibly be unregenerate. And it is hard to believe that a truly regenerated person could be unsanctified. So for me, it's, you know, in, in, with, with, in response to the sanctification, I think, there, I think at the time you receive Christ, there is instantaneous occurrence of the three, but I think the, the sanctification is a positional sanctification before God. But then I think it's also a progressive, ongoing process throughout your life. So let's take a look at my proposed progression from belief to faith to trust. How many of you believe this? That God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. How many of you believe that? All right. Well, if he is the same, can we not expect the same from him? If we believe he did, should we not believe that he can? And if we believe he can, should we not believe that he will? He will. He will honor what we're doing. Before we believe he will, first we have to believe in him. Believing in Jesus is key. To, to having faith in him, and those two are key to trusting him. Miracles. Now, there, there's lots of talk about what was the purpose of the miracles, and, you know, there's obvious benefits to the people that were healed and so forth, but, but, but there's, underlying, there's underlying reason for the miracles. John chapter 4 uh, verses 30, uh, 46 to 53, I'm now switching over to the, to the uh, NIV. It says, once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine, and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Unless you see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, You may go. Your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word, and he departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and all his family believed. Due to that miracle, they believed. The official saw, he experienced, he heard, he believed, and he led his family to believe in the man Jesus, God in the flesh. 
I'm using a lot of scripture, but it takes it to get my point across to you. John chapter 12, verses 9 to 11, New King James this time. Only because I think it explains it a little better. Now, a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. The miracle of the resurrection of Lazarus, many Jews went away and believed in Jesus. How many of you have either witnessed personally or have credible knowledge of a miracle performed by the Lord, then you have to believe. You have no choice but to believe. And belief is key. It's the first step. The first thing. John chapter 12, verses 17 to 19. Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason the people also met him, because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him, because they heard that he had done this. So how many of you, you've said there was a, a lot of you said you have either witnessed, been a part of, seen, or have credible knowledge of a miracle. Right? How many of you are sharing that? And you know, the, the Bible's good about telling the same story over and over and over. Why? There's power in it. There's power in your testimony. But not only have you shared it, have you shared it with unbelievers? Do you have the where to all to stand before an unbeliever and share the miracles you have either seen or have credible knowledge of? Some credible witnesses has told you about it. Um, and and, and it's, it's a matter of stepping forward. You know, when when uh, I've told this story too, when, when we were in, in Kenya, we had some people, I'm not going to wander far, Josh, you're up there. We had some people um, that came to visit us, and they were good Baptist people. I got nothing against the Baptists. I was born again in a Baptist church. They do a lot for the kingdom of God. They probably bring more people into the kingdom than anybody else. So I'm not putting them down, but they were from the Baptist faith, did not believe in miracles. So on the first Sunday that we were there, we were going to a little village out of uh, uh, Nairobi, and I was to speak. And along the way, they started talking about um, who's the miracle man, the little Benny Hinn. They started talking about Benny Hinn and how they didn't believe in Benny Hinn, and it was all put on, and it was all for show, and how can you stand there? Anybody could stand there and say, well, there's somebody here with a headache. Anybody could do that, you know? Well, Benny Hinn had just been to Nairobi like two weeks before that. And they had people falling out of trees when he would wave his hand at them. So anyway, I did, my first message was, was uh, there's two services there. There's probably five, six hundred people at each. And the first service is English, makes it easy. The second service was Swahili, so the pastor would, would translate for me. And at the end of it, because my friends and my wife were sitting on the front row, and I was up on the platform, and uh, the, the, I brought the, my message to an end. I said a, 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 a general prayer, you know, and I turned it over to the pastor to bring the, 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 to a conclusion and to dismiss the assembly. And while he was talking, God spoke to me. He said, there's a woman here, a woman, not women, a woman. He said that she's having pain in her left ear. Actually, it was her right ear. In her right ear. 
and it's got a noise in it. And he told me what the noise sounded like. He said, I want you to call that woman forth. I'm going to heal her. I said, but God, these people down here, as, as far as individuals, are my biggest supporters financially. And they don't believe in this stuff. Well, what am I going to do? I'd already taken them out in the Man of Bible Institute where everybody was praying in tongues. God said, call her forth. I said, but Lord, he said, if you call her forth and do this, they will be saved. Now, I didn't know what he meant. I went over to the pastor. I stopped him. I whispered in his ear. He gave it to me, and I made this announcement. There is a woman here. Now, we're talking five or 600 people sitting out there. There is a woman here. You have pain in this ear, and there is a sound. I want you to come. The Lord's going to heal you. One woman stood up. One and came forward and came up on the platform. And I laid hands on her ear. My good Baptist buddy sent and I'm laying hands. And I'm praying. And I may have slipped into tongues. I don't remember. And I finished praying. And God, this is true. God said, do the Benny Hinn thing. I said, what? The Benny Hinn thing. I knew what he was talking about. I said, but Lord, my friends, I've already done what you asked me to do. My, my, my supporters, my friends, and I, I can't, they, they'll be wanting to go to the airport tomorrow and they're going to cut me off. And Lord, what? He said, do the Benny Hinn thing. I said, okay. So I got over to the woman. Had her cover her good ear. And I backed up a little bit and I said, say praise the Lord. And I said, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, she said. So I backed up a little further. I said, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. She said, I backed up a little further. I said, say praise the Lord. She said, praise the Lord. And the place went nuts. I turned it back over to the pastor. At the bottom of the, of the uh, platform, there was a door that went out into a side courtyard. So I went that way. I did not want to go sit with my friends. My wife was there. That was a mess. I went out in that courtyard, and then they came out. My friend looked at me. He said, that was so awesome. And he, and he, he started to cry. I said, well, I'm sorry if I offended you. He said, no, you did what you were called to do. And I am so thankful. Now, listen to this. The pastor comes out. He said when it was over, two prostitutes came up. And because of the miracle they saw, they gave their life to Christ. God had told me, if you do this, they will be saved. And two prostitutes came up and received Christ. Miracles. They're intended for people to believe. They're intended for you to share. I brought something with me. I didn't know whether I'd use it or not, but I'll tell you what. You've got to bear with me a few minutes. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you a miracle. I'm going to tell you the, this miracle. I, I, I've, you've seen it, most all it more than once. But anyway, I had a friend that is a, 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 like an itinerant preacher, and he travels around and preaches a lot. And when I first shared this in a church where he was sitting among the congregation, he asked to borrow this, and he kept it for a year, going to different places, telling my story. And he told me, and people were saved. Now, it wasn't what he saw, it's what he heard me say. And he used it. So I'm going to give you a miracle. If you don't have, first off, I'm a miracle. To go from what I was to what I am now, that is a miracle. So, no, it's not there. Remember this? See, I like to share this over and 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 over. I keep this sitting in my study on a shelf so that every time I go in there and I look, I see it and I remember back because the Bible would have us to remember back. Just before they crossed into the promised land, Joshua gave them a history, didn't he? So this church was heavily involved in Guatemala. I had never been on a mission trip. I was a fairly new youth pastor, and this was in 
two, I believe. And here I am going to lead a team on a mission trip to the jungles of Guatemala. Never been. I've got teenagers and I've got adults. I have a good missionary, or was, in, in Nancy at the time, Strickland. Nancy could do anything. I saw her pull an abscessed tooth out of a man's head with no, nothing to kill the pain. She jerked it right out of there. So the way it worked is the, the morning after we arrived, we would have a medical clinic, and it would close at 12, and then we would do a VBS, and then we would do house-to-house -house visitation. Now, we're out in the middle of nowhere, no electricity, no water, no nothing. So on that first evening, my son, who went with us, became very sick to his stomach. So Nancy brought this bottle of KO pectate in to me, and it had duct tape on it. She said, give him two spoons of this, and she had a spoon. I did. I handed it back to Nancy. She said, we got a problem. I said, well, and remember, I don't know you. I said, what's the problem then? She said, well, we had a case of kaopectate that didn't make the flight. And we'll use a lot of it. There will be many people coming in with, with stomach problems, intestinal problems. And it did not make the trip. I said, well, I'm sorry. All we can do is pray. So the next day, we opened the medical plant, and she told me, the first morning we opened, there'll be a long line. The second uh, morning we opened, you will not see the end of the line. It will wander down the road into the jungle. You will not see the end. You will not see the end of the line until the day we leave. And that was true. When people heard there was free medical attention, they came from everywhere. On Tuesday afternoon, or just before vacation Bible school, I'm sitting there, I don't know, cutting out angels or doing something, getting ready for vacation Bible school. And Nancy comes to me and she said, Otis, she said, remember that bottle of KO pectate I gave you for your son? I said, yes. She said, how much was in it? I said, I don't know, Nancy. It was about half full. She said, well, I'm still giving people KO pectate from that bottle. Now, this was Sunday night and this was Tuesday. I said, really? I said, isn't God good? <laughs> Wednesday came. Thursday came, and it's the last day we're going to have the medical clinic. It's the first day I even went to the medical clinic. I had good people. They didn't need me. But on that day, I wanted to experience it before I left. They had a little stick hut. Russ, you remember little stick huts? There was a door at the front, and they'd knock some sticks out at the back to make a back door. And the people would come in through the front door and see Nancy. I don't remember if we had a doctor or PA. I don't remember what we had. See them, and they'd come by, and they'd have a slip of paper. It might have a, a medication written on it, and that would be given to them. They'd come to the door, and me and somebody else would stand there and lay hands on them and pray for them just as they left the hut. I stood there with these eyes, and I saw one of the teenagers taking little brown vials from a box, empty vials, and pouring KO pectate. I said, what? what? Really? But the Sunday that we came back, we were up here giving a report. And I said this, and I was very conservative. Hundreds, hundreds of people got KO pectate from a half bottle. I hope you can listen. You hear that? There's still kaopectate in it. Hundreds of people from a half bottle. Miracle. A miracle. I was there. There's other people in this church that were there. You can verify it with them. Then you can go tell it to an unbeliever. I did. I had a guy, I won't tell the denomination, that moved in when we were living in some apartments. And he was telling me about his wife, how she'd been a Baptist and he had gotten her saved and baptized properly. And we got to talking about the things of God and he was telling me how his dad was a doctor and there was no such things as, as miracles. They had ceased and no longer uh, came about. And I said, can you excuse me a minute? And I went to our, our apartment. I got this bottle of KO pectate and I came over and I told him the story. I said, now, you can either believe that miracles exist or you can call me a liar. He just shut up. Now, we moved shortly after that. We bought a house. So I don't know what effect it had on to be honest with you. But you've got to share. Miracles are meant to bring people to belief. Okay? 
All right. I know I'm taking all your time, but that's all right. You need this. Where am I at? <laughs> uh, John 12, nope, 17 to 19. Uh, Acts 2.22. says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. Now, when you know something, you're compelled to believe. And if you're compelled to believe, you should be compelled to, to share, to tell. I need my Bible. I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a little thing with you. Com compelled to tell at all risk, at all costs, right? Uh, Paul is imprisoned, and uh, he, is, he, is, he, is, he is brought before uh, governor, Governor Festus and King Agrippa. They want to hear what he's got to say. So in Acts, Acts, that's in the New Testament, right? Acts. Acts 26. I'm not going to read it all. In, uh, in, in, in this, this is a New King James. The, the section I'm going to read to you, it, the, the heading on it is Agrippa Perry's Paul's Challenge. <laughs> now, as he thus made, now Paul has shared his testimony. And he shared about getting knocked off the horse. And he's, he shared about what he was and what he's become. And he shared about the, 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 the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, he shared all that with them. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you know, he was a very educated man. Paul was. Like Russ. Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. It was not done hidden. It was not done in a, uh, a corner. Miracles you have seen. Miracles you know of, they, were, they weren't done in secret. There's been miracles happening right here in this room. They're not hidden. Christ is not hiding. He does not have a veiled message. I'm sorry, I get excited. I'm, I'm having to work on staying here. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. <laughs> Now, some, 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 some translations say, uh, do you think in such a short time you can persuade me? But the, the, the new King James says, you almost persuade. That's a big step for King. You almost persuade. All Paul might have needed was a few more visits, a little more time. And why? Because he shared Hebrews 2, 1 to 4, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its uh, just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. I'm telling you, if you hear credibly, it's confirmed for you. You believe. God also testified it to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Have you seen the gifts of the Holy Spirit being exercised in this room? Then you have to believe. That's one of the signs. 
tongue. A great sign for unbelievers. Russ said that last week. When used properly. John 2, 11. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. They saw, they believed, and then they had faith. You can't have faith unless you believe. Is that right? How can you have faith in something you don't even believe? They believed, and they put their faith in him. So if, if, if you believe and if you have faith, then that faith you should put into the person of Jesus Christ and to him alone. Because I'm going to tell you, man will let you down. But Christ will never let you down. I'm skipping some, okay? I'm trying to find my way here now. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. You see, we believe in what we see, what we have experienced, what we have heard, right? But faith is believing and expecting what we cannot see. That's faith. It's different than belief. You have to have belief to have the faith, and they are different. Hebrews 11, 7, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah had faith in things not yet seen. He had not seen this flood. How long did it take him to build that ark? 100 years? Some say it had not rained before that. I don't know. Russ, do you know? Thanks for the help. Noah had faith. But see, he also trusted. Because look what he did. He took that step. Remember that step I was telling you about? If you have, if you have a little faith, now it's time to trust. And he demonstrates his trust in that he began to build the ark. And he received much condemnation from his fellow man. And he separated himself from a wicked world because he had trust. He believed, he had faith, and he trusted God. And he worked on this ark. He trusted that this ark would hold two of every animal on the face of the earth. He trusted that. He built an ark. We have been entrusted with a mission. And for some, the mission seems impossible. For some, it seems wrong. For some, it may seem wicked. But let me tell you something. It is of God. He has given us a role to play in the end time harvest. I believe in God. I have faith that he gave us this mission. And I trust him to carry this mission out. I trust him enough that I'm going to Russia for the second time. I might be hopping around on one leg, but I'm going. Because I trust him. I've got, I've got trust in him. All right, we're going to take a final look at this progression. The progression from... From belief to faith to trust. And I'm not going to read all this. I'm just going to, I'm going to, because uh, it's, it's two pages full. Um, Abraham, he, he has his son Isaac. When, 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 when they were too old to have children. And he has his son Isaac, and he loves Isaac. Oh, man, he loves Isaac. And then one day God speaks to him. He says, I want you to take Isaac. And I want you to take him to this mountain that I will reveal to you. And there I want you to sacrifice him to me. Now, we know that Abraham believed because when God first called him, he had enough faith in his belief to leave his home and venture out. Now, he's got enough faith to follow what God is asking of him. So him and Isaac and two servants, after they cut a big old bundle of wood, they load up and they head out. And sometime during the journey, Abraham looked ahead and he saw the mountain that God had told him about. 
he saw, he believed, right? He saw and he believed. And, I, and, and he, before he left, he told his servants, he said, you guys wait here. Isaac and I will go and worship the Lord, and then we will return. We will return. That's faith, right? So as they're going up onto the mountain, he and Isaac alone, and he's got this bundle of wood, and he's got his flint and his whatever, matches, Zippo, I don't know. Uh, Isaac says, well, 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 hey, Dad, he said, well, where's the sacrificial lamb? You know, well, how, are we, how are we going to do this? Faith, faith. Abraham says, the Lord will provide, son. They go up, he spreads the, the kindling and all out, and he, he binds his, his beloved Isaac, and he places him there, and he, he, he takes the knife, and he raises it up. Now, he has moved into trust, hasn't he? He's put that faith to work. He has lifted that knife, ready to plunge it down. He has taken that step from faith to trust, and then, a voice tells him, do not, do not. God pretty much says, I'm not going to take your only son from you. You have demonstrated your faith. You have demonstrated your trust. He said, I was, and he, God, and this wasn't said there, but I believe God was thinking, and there is another sacrifice to come of another son. I believe that. So that was trust, was it not? So that, that's what I'm telling you. That's the progression I see. We believe, we have faith, and, and then we got, we got to move into trust. And that's what we need. We got to trust that God knows what he's doing with us. We've got to trust that although we have become smaller, I trust that some were moved because they needed to be moved. I'm convinced some moved and they shouldn't have. I'm convinced of all that. But I trust God in no matter what the reason or whatever. I trust him no matter how small we are that we can accomplish this. I trust that my pastor received this and over several years became convinced that there is a Russian Orthodox Seret. Is that the right word? Theret that's going to raise from the dead and begin and preach, preach a message of, of repentance. I believe, I believe that, and I trust that, and I'm going to, be, to, to help play our role in that, and, and you too. too. Faith and trust, they work together. Uh, James 2.20 says, faith without works is dead. Now, you can't have trust without faith, and faith without trust is just belief, Right? And belief alone without faith has no power and it's dead. If you believe but have not faith, it's dead. If you believe and have faith but you don't trust and step out and do, it's dead. And that's what we're called to do. It's a powerful thing, trust. It's a powerful, powerful thing. So I'm, I'm asking you, do you believe this morning? Do you have faith in God Almighty this morning? Do you, have, do you have faith in his son, Jesus Christ? Do you have faith in the precious spirit of the living God? Do you trust the three of them? Do you trust them enough to follow them? Do you trust them enough to be a part? Do you trust them enough to be the backup? Do you trust them enough to, to, to build a foundation of prayer? Do you? Father, I ask, Lord, that if there be anyone here that is, that is weak in belief, Lord, that you would help them. Father, there was a man, and he asked Jesus to, to heal uh, his son, I think it was, Lord. And, and Jesus said, all things are possible for him that believes. And the man made this statement, Father, it just blows me away. He said, I do believe, Lord, help me with my unbelief. Father, if, if there's anyone here, they believe, but follow there's areas that their belief is weak. I ask for your spirit to minister to them, to help them with their unbelief. I, I ask, faith, Lord, that our faith be built upon the foundation of the rock of the knowledge of Christ. I pray, Father, for trust, 
trust, Lord, to be a part of our makeup, that we would all put our trust in you and step out, Lord, step out. So, Father, I, I kind of place it all in your hands. I place the people of this congregation in your hands because I trust you with them. I place this mission in your hands because I trust you in it. Father, I pray a blessing. I pray a blessing upon this congregation. I pray, e pray each person here, Father, be blessed in the name of Jesus Christ. And that today, Lord, we will go out. And as the song says, Lord, we will just shout his name. The name above all names. Be pleased with us, Lord. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.